So yeah, so thanks so much for having me tonight. Um, as mentioned, I'm a Liberero and NSERC uh, postdoctoral fellow, which effectively means that I finished my PhD recently at the University of Victoria, and I've begun studying under the supervision of Isabel Cote as a postdoc, which means I run a research project that's very close to my and Isabel's interests, and effectively I'll be doing research on this topic for the next three years. Um, a brief note on that, as mentioned, my PhD was on a somewhat unrelated topic and I'm about 16 weeks into this project. So much of what I'll be talking tonight is ongoing research or theories we're exploring. Um, but because of some exciting collaborations I started during my PhD, I also have a mix of novel products to share with you as well. So since I moved to Vancouver, I'm now very fortunate to live, work, and play in the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, Coquitlam nations unceded territory. And I'm very grateful for these nations and their continued stewardship of these lands. Now, some scientists say that they stand on the shoulders of giants. And I would argue that I'm actually lucky enough to work with several. And really, this is just a subset of the people that make this work possible. And I'd like to thank and acknowledge all of these people, because without them, none of the work that I do would be possible. And this includes my previous work, but also my postdoc. And really, it's a collaborative effort, as any good endeavor should be. And as mentioned, we're very fortunate in that we receive funding from several institutions and agencies. And personally, I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to the Liberero Fellowship Program and NSERC for supporting my research. So how do species navigate this environment? How do they communicate with conspecifics, so related species? How do they find their prey avoid their predators? These are really broad, long-standing questions in the studies of coral reef ecology. This coral reef for reference is in West Papua, Indonesia. And how do species navigate this kelp forest 12,000 kilometers away? Or sorry, 1,200 kilometers away, using similar cues and mechanisms, perhaps. So if we consider a representative individual, say this common blue striped snapper, but really this could be any fish from either of those situations, we may assume that this species perceives these ecosystems visually, much like we did when we were viewing those photos. But unfortunately, for the taxa living in these systems, um, sorry, I just want to check very briefly. You're seeing my full screen, correct? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, for the taxa living in these systems, light and as a consequence, color declines quite rapidly with depth. Now, this is going to vary depending on the specifics of the environment you're in. But generally, what that means is that the light and color within a coral reef or kelp forest will be greatly reduced by about 20 or 30 meter depths, which is around where those color, those photos were taken, meaning I had to introduce a lot of light into that system. Now, what this means is we can say that the use of visual cues to navigate either of these environments is going to have a very limited range, very similar to your visual acuity as you navigate your environment. There's a limit to it. How about chemical cues? Taking advantage of fish's olfactory senses. Well, if you've ever spent any time in marine ecosystems, you know that they're not static, and that they don't stay still. And a portion of this is attributed to the movement of water. And this can cause chemical cues to move with the current instead of the intended direction.
Now this means that chemicals will likely not radiate evenly or even towards the intended receiver, making their use as a cue for navigating an environment somewhat unpredictable, right? So they're gonna move with the water more than where you want them to go in many cases. Pardon me? Sorry. Nope, quite all right. Um, Okay, so what about sound? Well, as water is 800 times denser than air, sound travels about five times faster, radiating in all directions. Now, just to put this in context, that means that the information embedded within sound can travel at a rate of 1400 meters per second in water compared to 13 or sorry compared to 350 meters per second in air you know this allows this information to span considerable distances very quickly and for any of you that have been scuba diving you'll be really familiar with how challenging this is to get used to as a boat that is hundreds of meters away can sound like it's right overhead and this is why Now, this means that sound may be a cue for species navigating these environments that is more reliable than visual or chemical signals. Now, collectively, these illustrations depict a species' visual, olfactory, and listening spaces, which denotes the distance at which a signal can be detected by the individual. Now, each of these and their specific distances will vary by taxa. So that means that each fish is gonna have a slightly different hearing ability, chemical detection, or visual range. But the order, so how far each of them can expand, may be relatively conserved. And in the case of the acoustic listening space, we know that fish are able to detect the information that is embedded in underwater noise through several structures. Now, generally, fish have inner ears that in many ways resemble those of the vertebrate ears you're probably more familiar with, each of which has several otoliths, which no, you as a vertebrate do not have. Uh, but these are shown here in yellow, sensory epithelium and semicircular canals which you do have, it's how you orient yourself in your environment. Now, relative motion between sensory cells in the epithelium and the otolith detect changes in particle motion, which is how sound moves in the water. Now, at least one person is thinking it and they don't wanna ask it. So I'll just get this out of the way. Fish do not have external ears because of the consistency between tissue and water. And what this does is it allows sound to travel through the tissue of the fish to the hearing structure without the use of an external or a middle ear structure like we have. Now, the lateral line that many or actually all fish possess detects uh, particle motion using the same mechano sensory cells found in the inner ear. And this is particularly good in detecting noise in the near field. Basically what's going on immediately adjacent to the fish. And this is done through hydrodynamic stimulation. And many fish have more than one lateral line. And so you can find certain species that have six of these all over their body or in various places in their body, because they are still discrete in their, um, in their orientation. Now, many fish possess secondary hearing mechanisms, including a variety of gas-filled cavities, which the body, uh, which connect the body and the swim bladder in a way that allows for a pressure to particle motion transducer, which increases the hearing sensitivity. And I know that's a bit, so we'll unpack it. A good example of this 
is the Weberian apparatus, which is shown here. And basically this is four bones or four pairs of bones that connect the inner ear to the swim bladder. So the swim bladder is this big reservoir of gas in a fish that allows it to maintain its body, uh, its buoyancy in the water column. And evolution has taken advantage of this because as this is hit with a sound wave, it vibrates. And so if you put a bone on there, that can send the signal to the inner ear more effectively. Now, we can examine the influence that these structures have on fish hearing thresholds, which essentially is how loud a sound must be to be detectable at a given frequency. Now, I kind of joked earlier, but just a reminder, frequency and pitch are very similar. So when you've ever heard someone have a conversation about singing at a high pitch, they were also talking about frequency. And for those of you that have been to hearing tests, I certainly have as a diver because it's part of our medical exam, this is what they're testing, right? Where's your hearing threshold? How quiet can you hear a sound? And examining hearing thresholds in this way allows us to plot the relationship between threshold and frequency as a line for different uh, power levels or decibels. And the lower this line is along the y-axis, the better the species is at detecting noise. And if the Weberian apparatus is experimentally removed, then unfortunately for the fish, I mean, in many ways, its hearing threshold increases by about 30 decibels on average, in this case anyways. This again will be taxa specific. Now just for context, that's the difference between a typewriter and a lawnmower. So quite an incredible shift in hearing ability. Now, taxa also exhibit a diverse range in swim bladder sizes and orientations relative to the inner ear. So two examples here are cichlids that lack swim bladder extensions. So they don't have a connector between their swim bladder and their inner ear, but their swim bladders are different sizes. And this shifts their hearing abilities. And a third species of cichlid that has that connection between the swim bladder and the inner ear, which exhibits a notable shift in hearing ability. So it can hear much quieter sounds as a result. Now fish, they use these hearing abilities to detect a wide range of ocean sounds. And broadly, we can consider these to be of bio, geo, or anthrophony, in origin. And what I mean by that is that anthrophony sounds are generated by human activities. Geophony are uh, originating from abiotic structures. So this is sea ice or rain. And you know that may seem kind of silly, silly in some way, but actually the sounds of sea ice can be quite deafening. And this is true of rain and wind as well. And biophony are sounds of biological origin. And so this can be the humpback sol songs that many of us have probably heard, but it can also be the sounds generated within kelp forests or coral reefs. Now, marine fish contribute considerably to these soundscapes. And they do so using a series of mechanisms. And these include contracting that swim bladder we talked about, that gas-filled cavity, much like a drum using sonic muscles. So this is very analogous to beating a drum. You're using your muscles to beat a structure that is fixed and contains air. Or striagulation, which is basically just a fancy word for grinding bones or other hard parts together to produce noise. And plucking tendons using sonic muscles. And this last one I found kind of odd when I started looking into this. And just to note that this is relatively common in certain aquarium trade fishes 
So if any of you keep specifically some certain species of freshwater fish, they may be doing this in your tank. Now, fish produce these sounds to facilitate various ecological interactions. So these can range from the pursuit of prey, the perception of conspecifics, or mediating things like growth and reproduction. And we know that fish's contribution to the soundscape is important because over the previous millennia, our understanding of underwater noise has expanded considerably. And this includes several notable discoveries and innovations. But what isn't on here is a list of the extent to which fish are contributing to aquatic soundscapes. So that's to say how many species of fish make noise. And this mystery has persisted despite the fact that fishes are the most diverse group of vertebrates. There's 34,000 species of fish and growing recognition of the various ways that these species make noise. And just a note for those of you that are starting to detect noises from mine, uh, I have a, a large dog here that is gonna start making some noises as he wakes up. His name's Oban, by the way. And so with this in mind, this big lacking question of how many species of fish make noise, you know, really, and this is like a fundamental question in the field. This is like asking how many species of fish are there? How many species of bird sing? These are important questions for the foundations of this field. So with this in mind, several colleagues and I examined sound production in fishes. And this study was led by Audrey Luby, a PhD student at the University of Florida. After we connected on this mutual interest while we were both conducting research with the Smithsonian. And so we approached this question, how many species of fish produce sound? And in doing so, we broke it down to include active and passive sounds. And what I mean by that is sounds that are produced intentionally as an individual guys, to contribute to their soundscape or those that are produced as a byproduct of an activity. And when we consider active sounds, we would say that they are produced by siniferous fishes. And to address this question, we conducted a literature review that spanned 60 countries, including documents in 11 different languages covering 1847 to 2018. And this review identified 3000 relevant sources of literature on the topic. And from this, 834 met the criteria for data extraction. So what that means is that when we looked at all the work that's been done over the entire world, we were able to find 834 documents referencing noise production in fishes. And so we had to pull all of that information out to really address this question. And Audrey, complete hats off to her. She's a rising star in this field for leading this effort. And so extracting these data uh, from these different sources allowed us to determine that 1,185 species of fish have been examined for sound production. Over 1,000 produce sound, and the vast majority of these, 989, are doing so in an active way. So they are contributing to their soundscape and using sound to influence their environment. And we also found evidence that sinifery in fishes is taxonomically widespread. And what I mean by that is that it spans 33 orders, 133 families, and 989 species. Now, just for reference, that's over half of all the orders of fishes. There's 62 orders of fishes in total, and so 33 of them have confirmed so far to be siniferous, at least with one species in that order. And it's about a fourth of all the families, if you're a real taxonomist. Now, we also 
observed considerable geographic coverage. In that, I mean that Siniferous taxa occupy every marine and freshwater body that uh, fish base, the leading authority on the distribution of fishes considers. And so this means that various climatic zones, habitat types, and bodies of water all have Siniferous fishes in them, except for Antarctica. Now, really, we feel this is a lack of examination more than a lack of occurrence. And so this is because not much research has been done in fishes in this area. And so we're confident that in the next coming decade or so, we'll start to add more species to this map in this location. And it seems to be the case that the highest densities of somniferous fishes, so where you're most likely to find the most species contributing to their soundscape, occurs 30 degrees on either side of the equator. However, it's also important to consider the relative abundance. And that is to say, how often do soniferous taxa occur as a percentage of the species pool or how many species are in the area? So if you've been to a coral reef, you know that there's many species of fish there. And as you move north, we seem to find less species of fish, but it seems to be the case that as we move north, more of those species of fish are soniferous. And so we find elevated relative abundances of soniferous fishes in higher latitudes. And as a northerner, I found this really exciting. It's also interesting to think about the water clarity and how valuable sound may be in these kind of environments where you're more likely to have dark days and nights and deep dark water that's nutrient rich. And we also found that sniffer species have been observed in a range of zones. And this includes probably most notably coral reef, demersal, and benthoplagic regions. And demersal and benthoplagic regions are associated with that low light condition that I was talking about. And kind of a neat percentage for coral reefs is that 5%, actually above 5%, of the species that you see on a coral reef have already been documented to contribute to their soundscapes. But that's really exciting. Now we can also consider the detection limits of the current sampling approaches. And when we do, basically what we ask is if we were to double the sampling effort, how many more fish species would we predict we would observe? So what this graph shows is that as those lines continue on, where they become dotted is where we don't have any data, but where they're solid, we have data. And so we're saying, okay, given the trend in detection, what would we consider if we continue this approach as ecologists, as we keep up what we're doing, how many soniferous fishes are we gonna find? And it seems to be the case that we'll find at least just shy of 1500. Now, it's really important to note that this is not what we would consider the global soniferous fish diversity. We assume that estimate would be an order of magnitude higher, but this is a number that we are really confident will be detected within the coming decade. It's also a bit of a, should we continue what we're doing, right? There's a real argument for, should we do something really neat and novel and start heading maybe into Antarctica and asking questions in different ways? To give you context to that, what I mean is right now, if you want to find out a fish is soniferous, you're going to look at its morphology, its hearing ability, you're going to put it in a tank and you're going to leave it there and see if it makes a noise. You're maybe going to put out some hydrophones, these kind of things, but perhaps we should change that. Maybe we should survey really broad numbers of fishes at once, these kind of things. And that's what this data is really useful for. Now, if any of you have ever uh, conducted a literature review or even tried to you know, read a couple of scientific papers, you know that reviewing and extracting data from 834 sources is a staggering amount of work. And this fact, in combination with our recognition of the novelty and importance of this work, made us really acutely aware that we need to develop it further. Right, it can't just stop at a publication. 
And so with that in mind, we expanded our working group considerably, including forming a collaboration with Meridian. And Meridian is a CFI, which is a government funded uh, program that aims to connect ocean researchers and computer scientists to develop cyber infrastructure for underwater acoustics. It's really perfect for what we're trying to do. And Meridian's senior data manager, Sarah Vila, specifically joined our project to develop the Fish Sounds web portal. And fishsounds.net officially launched last year. And this site catalogs the activity uh, or the catalogs active and passive sound production by 1,085 species of fishes. It includes 238 exemplary recordings and all of the references, all 800 of them needed to support this data. And this is gonna be a process and a data set that we continually update, meaning that we'll, as more data comes in and more work is done, we'll make sure that this number is constantly at the best estimate we have. And this allows users to search and download this information by taxa. So what kind of fish, what kind of genus, family, species, these kind of things, specific sound types, references, or by region. So if you're really interested in, you know, the Pacific, what's outside our door, um, the North Pacific, you can search by that region and get a sense of what has been observed. Now the sound production entries include whether there was a physiological, auditory, or visual examination, if the sound was determined to be passive or active, and again, it includes all supporting references. And so really what we're trying to do here is build the scaffolding to showcase the research that's been done, but make sure those researchers are credited for their efforts. And we do that by putting their references up front so that people can connect to those papers. And the species information for this website was derived from FishBase. Now remember that's the leading uh, resource on fish's distribution and diversity big uh, component of uh, some of the work done at UBC. And the majority of the species photos came from iNaturalist, which is hopefully an online platform that you've heard of. So really we wanna tip our hats to these organizations for providing the structure we needed to develop fish sounds. And in many ways they paved the way for the work we're doing. Now the auditory recording, the audio recordings, include a spectrogram and an image and then all of the acoustic characteristics. So the frequency, the decibels, these kind of things. And if you're really just interested in the data, so if you're a researcher or you're running a course or something like that, you can search that directly. So really just an archive of all of the available information on this topic. And this is just phase one of Fish Sounds. So we'll continue to develop the functionality of this website over the next few years. We've been talking about making user profiles, increasing data visualizations, a portal for data uploading so people who make observations can contribute them directly. Um, unfortunately, this is just a side note, I will not be playing any sounds tonight. For those of you who have used Zoom before for audio, it's a horrible experience to say the least and it's kind of well known within the soundscape community that it's not worth the risk in many times but if you go to this website there'll be a species highlighted on the side you can play all the sounds directly obviously don't do it now wait till my talk is over um, but check out fish sounds um, i'm you know and we're really keen for feedback so if anything comes up just let me know i'd be really really excited to hear from you and we're on twitter if you'd like to follow us there now Developing a catalog of species that are contributing to sound scrapes is great. You know, it's a, it's a really neat effort and it's been a novel project that we're all very proud of. But personally, what I find really exciting is the life histories that are mediated by sound. So I thought I would just kind of pause for a second here and discuss one of the really interesting species that exists on our coast that some of you may have heard of and some of you may have actually heard. And that is, Perichthys notatus, the plain fin midshipman. 
Now, what's really interesting about this fish is that for the majority of the year, they live at depths that can be deeper than a thousand feet. But in May, they start to migrate up from these depths to breed in the intertidal. So this is my attempt at animation. And three types of midshipmen make this migration. Seen left to right here, type two males, type one males, and females. Now these individuals would all be of similar ages. Now, what I mean by that is the size difference between the type one male on the far left and the type two male, or sorry, the type two male on the far left and the type one male in the middle, that's not a function of age. It's a function of different life histories. Now, the males and the females and the two different types of males have allocated different amounts of resources in their development to gonads and vocal organs. And so in this case, sounds are produced by contracting the sonic muscles surrounding the swim bladder, like we talked about earlier. And this is much more developed and pronounced in the type one male. So big muscles loaded with ATP, able to maintain contractions for quite some time. While the type two male has put a lot more resources into gonad development. And this is really, really relative to body size as well. So you saw how small they are. In many ways, you could argue that they're basically mostly gonads. And the female, which has a larger body size, has also allocated more resources to egg development. And this isn't surprising. Egg development is very costly, but it's very beneficial for the species. Now these different physiological adaptations in part have arisen due to the various life histories that these different uh, individuals engage in when they're breeding in this habitat. So what we see here is a shallow water, soft sediment or cobble beach with rocky outcrops. And this is an ideal midshipman habitat. And just to, again, to tip my hat to some of the incredible work that's been done in this field, um, Seagal um, Balshin here from McMaster's has led a lab that has spent, you know, probably over a decade at this point, picking apart many of the nuances of these relationships. And she's also been a really great collaborator in this space. Now, they're headed to the intertidal to build nests in those rocky outcrops. That is the name of the game for the type one midshipman. And just a reminder, the type one male is the big male, large sonic muscles, and they're there to establish a nest. And that's not easy because there's not always nests for everybody. Some nests are better than others. Someone maybe built a really great nest and now they have to fight to keep it. And so really this is a battleground in many ways. So these males are headed in, they're building nests, they're competing with each other. And this process goes on throughout the entire breeding season, which runs from about April to July. Now, once these nests are established, the females enter the situation and they have to determine which males to mate with. Now, remember, females must be careful who they allocate eggs to because a considerable amount of resources went into egg development. So they have to make sure that they're giving their offspring the best chance of survival. It's a tough world in the intertidal. And so the males use their sonic muscles and their swim bladders to hum. Really, it's more of a song. And they use this song to attract females. The more impressive the song, the more attractive the male. And so these males sing long and loud. And if you've ever lived near the water or been at uh, the water tide line around nighttime, you can hear this. When we have them in the lab for work, they hum, you know, well into the night, just mm, like really long, really loud hums. It's really an impressive thing. 
And so really, this is sound mediated courtship. And the females will allocate eggs accordingly to the quality of males. So unfortunately, life's not fair. Everyone doesn't get an equal allocation. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch on the type two males as, although fascinating, their interactions are rarely mediated by sound. And they're really similar to Jack's, if you're aware of what that means. If not, effectively, it's a life history where the name of the game is to sneak in and fertilize a nest and then have a type, in this case, the type one males raise your offspring and protect them. So that's another version of this life history. Now, midshipmen occupy waters that we frequent, which means that this sound mediated courtship doesn't exist in isolation. We've introduced considerable amounts of noise pollution into these systems. And so really the question becomes, how do these interactions change in this condition? And we really want to think about this question. One of the ways I like to consider it is how we would probably be modified in a similar situation, right? So how do we change our social behavior when interacting in a noisy place? Now, I know this situation may seem a bit foreign to us after a couple of years in isolation, but hopefully we can remember the ways that we would alter our speech, our volume, our pitch, even how much we talk or when we talk. This is something I've personally interacted with. And the thing that's really interesting about this is you kind of do it without being aware that it's happening. It's involuntary, if you will. And what I'm talking about is called the Lombard effect or the Lombard reflex, which is the involuntary tendency for the speaker to change the volume when they're speaking in a noisy environment. Or they can change other characteristics like pitch, rate, or duration of certain sounds. And so this is something that we should consider when thinking about how sound mediated courtship may change. And so to study this, Nick Brown, a master's student at the Juanes lab in the, or at the sorry, in the Juanes lab at the University of Victoria, co-supervised by Seagal, the researcher who I previously mentioned from McMaster, conducted a field experiment. And Nick, modified several intertidal nets. He put out a recorder. He deployed what's called a noise egg, which is really just a noise producing, very controllable stimulus. And so it just sits in the intertidal and it effectively rattles. It produces a noise that's considered noise pollution. And it allows a subset of nests in a group of nests to be modified, providing that experimental control and experimental group that we need to draw inferences as scientists. And then you can remove the egg and see how the individuals from those nests that were exposed alter their sound production. Now, Nick and his colleagues were really fundamentally interested in how these different calls change. So how, now I mentioned the hum, but midshipmen actually grunt and they growl and they hum. And just because some of you are probably curious, grunts and growls are mostly associated with uh, other individuals coming into nests. So territoriality, or let's say a crab comes into a nest to try to eat your eggs, you're gonna grunt at them or you're gonna growl at them. Um, but really the question is, how do these things change? And to equate you with the graph, the bottom axis is time. The y-axis or the axis along the left side is frequency. So that's how high pitch a sound is. And then color denotes the, uh, how loud it is or the sound power. And 
this kind of analysis allowed Nick to say, okay, how does the power, so the sound pressure level change? And what he noted was that as you have noise introduced, you do find an increase in sound pressure levels. So individuals are changing their contribution to the soundscape. And this, because the hum is so important in midshipmen, happens if you're considering the hum not being there. So these are the grunts and the growls and the hum being there. And so really what they were able to note is this increase in amplitude of male humming, which is, as we mentioned, the Lombard effect. And this also was associated with a uh, frequency change and a change in the amount of calling that was happening. The really important part, and this kind of gives a little bit of hope to this story, is that when they followed mating success, they found no change. And so at least in this very specific scenario, it's this neat example of behavior being able to regulate a pollutant and still continue with the aim of reproducing successfully. So kind of a bit of a good news story under these conditions. But unfortunately, noise pollution is not the only anthropogenic stressor influencing this relationship. As you heard from Chris Harley a couple of weeks ago, the West Coast is experiencing considerable heat waves. With the intertidal being an area of considerable concern. Now, as I mentioned, midshipmen nest in the intertidal. This is an example of one such nest. So this rock has been pulled up. This individual is sitting. This is a type one male and they're sitting in basically what is a pool of water that remains as the tide goes out. But just to put this in context, these are researchers from McMaster's surveying midshipmen nests. So they are very far from the subtidal region. And so one of this summer, one of the things we're going to be exploring is how the raising temperatures may influence midshipmen courtship, thinking specifically about the physiological toll that this heat wave issue may have on the males, the availability of potential nesting sites as thermal gradients shift. So as the intertidal warms up, does the number of nests available to midshipmen decline? And does nest survival decline with increasing heat? Now, as I mentioned, I'm about 16 weeks into my postdoc. Uh, 17 weeks ago, I was a very stressed PhD student defender in a doctorate. So this is work that's ongoing, um, but I'd be very excited uh, to come back and present it one day as we work through this concept, because I think it's very important. We've also been in contact with Chris about this as well, because obviously he would be a great person to collaborate with. But really, you know, thinking about fish sounds in a little bit more detail and that same topic of midshipmen, it becomes very clear that the concophony of biological noises that fish sounds documents does not exist in isolation anymore. Aquatic species now contend with multiple and ever expanding noise pollution. And some research that I summarized a few years ago showed that fish that interact with noise pollution forage less often. So they're less able to spend time looking for food, a very important thing that fish need to do. They move more. And this is especially true of movements that are associated with startle responses. And they experience an increased cost of reproduction. They also have increased hearing thresholds. Now, if we think back to those graphs, what that means is that they become temporarily deaf to certain frequencies and decibels when exposed to noise pollution. So very similar to if you go to a rock concert the next day or even the next hour, you're gonna have a shift in the noise that you would need to be exposed to to hear it. And these stressors are reflected in their blood cortisol levels, which increase. 
And some of the work we're currently doing now is looking at how secondary hearing mechanisms, so the Weberian apparatus, may influence the perception of underwater noise. So just a reminder, that's a series of bones that connect the swim bladder to the inner ear to increase the, or to change the hearing threshold of the species. Sorry, I've got a dog here that's got a treat he wants. And although very preliminary, this is some work that I'm doing with some researchers uh, from Brazil, we've been able to determine that taxa may be more susceptible to anthropogenic, biological, and tonal noises if they have this structure, but better able to ignore environmental sounds. So distinguish what is an environmental sound and pay less attention to it. However, fishes are far from the only taxa influenced by aquatic soundscapes. Including vertebrates in this dialogue is essential. And so to address this, Haley Davies, a PhD candidate at the, in the WANAS lab at the University of Victoria and I, are surveying the global literature on this topic, shown here as country of origin where the research was conducted. And again, we're doing a literature review to get down to how many studies have addressed this topic, thinking specifically about how marine invertebrates, behavior and physiology are influenced by the prevailing soundscape. And although very preliminary, we've been able to summarize several decades of research focusing primarily on anthropogenic noise pollution. And for any of you, and I'm, from the sounds of your uh, trips that you have planned, most of you have interacted with invertebrates. And so you can probably appreciate that the responses are highly variable, much more than we see in fish. And this is really you know, uh, a function of how diverse invertebrates truly are in the ways that they interact with the, in, with the world. And so we're dealing with this data right now. But I think, you know, although it's a bit chaotic, it kind of presents this exciting opportunity to further unravel the extent to which ocean soundscapes influence species' ability to navigate their environments. And this is, you know, hopefully in some regards a good news story as well, where you know, not everything is an impact in the negative direction. Some species may be taking advantage of changing soundscapes. So we're really excited to get into this and we'll have to keep you tuned on future data. Now, currently the release of noise pollution and the ecological effects it, occur, it produces occur uh, unimpeded. And that is to say that there's no, <laughs> I'm sorry, hold on a second. Yeah. Sorry about that. I have a very big dog that wants to go out at 8.30. Um, okay, so yeah, the big issue here, one of the big issues anyways in this field is that the release of noise pollution and any of the ecological consequences occur unimpeded. And that's because there is no federal or provincial laws regulating noise pollution in Canada. And this is also true internationally. And this has occurred despite really numerous calls to regulate this pollutant. And this has motivated Fisheries and Oceans Canada to begin developing an ocean noise strategy. And although a step in the right direction, we can assume this is years, if not decades, unfortunately, away from influencing acts and regulations, which are really how we influence species protection in Canada. And in the meantime, you know, before that decade kind of mark, we need to consider existing conservation strategies that may be mitigating species exposure to this pollutant. Now, one such strategy that exists here on our coast is rockfish conservation areas, which were developed and implemented by DFO in 2007 to address the decline in inshore rockfish. However, these protected areas still allow a number of recreational and commercial fisheries to persist. So all of these 
can be done in rockfish conservation areas. You can run a commercial ground fish midwater trawl through an RCA. Might create a little bit of noise. Um, and so to examine if these areas are acting as acoustic refugia from noise pollution and really protecting several species that are known to be siniferous. So rockfish do produce noise as well. We examined noise pollution levels inside and outside of RCAs as part of a Coney 2 Healthy Oceans project. And to do this, we deployed hydrophones, so basically underwater microphones, in three RCAs surrounding southern Vancouver Island, denoted here in red, and three unprotected areas in blue. And just a note for any divers in the room, these are my favorite projects to say yes to as a collaborator, because I get to spend a year jumping in and out of the water in the Pacific as I look for hydrophones I left there a couple of weeks prior. Unfortunately, we found very little evidence that RCAs are limiting species exposure to noise pollution in low frequency bands. And this is the listening space that rockfish use when communicating vocally. And although there's some evidence that RCAs may mitigate higher frequencies, the trends are inconsistent. And they're certainly not indicative of any sort of acoustic refugia. Now, this is just three RCAs near Victoria, but these findings are concerning as the 162 RCAs on the coast exist against a backdrop of considerable noise pollution levels. And again, this is something that I'm gonna be following up as part of my fellowship with the Liberero Society. And we're gonna be thinking specifically about how regulating species exposure to noise pollution may also mitigate other stressors, i.e. should we be making a push to regulate noise pollution in RCAs or other protected areas because we may also limit their exposure to things that are stressful. Now, zooming all the way out and thinking about Canada's pending noise pollution strategy, we're also evaluating the extent to which uh, regulating a pollutant that, when focusing primarily on cetaceans, may also protect fish and invertebrates. And so you may have noticed from many of the guides that I put up, cetaceans are the focus of this conversation right now. But an important question is, are they acting as a conservation umbrella for these other species? And what that means is, does the protection of cetaceans mean that a lot of marine life is protected? Or do we have to have more nuanced conversations about the many species that occupy these waters? But again, international, and national underwater noise regulations are still being developed. So this is not a conversation that is being had today in terms of regulation. So what is mitigating species exposure to noise pollution? We know it's not RCAs. We know it's not existing acts or, or um, regulations. Well, one of the things we're proposing is mitigating species exposure exists within this photo. And that's kelp forests. Right, and so many of you have probably stood in a big forest in the Pacific, hopefully, and you've heard the change in the sound, right? That stillness. The same thing actually happens when it snows. There's a decibel decrease. And we're thinking that in many ways, kelp forests are acting as a bioenergetic barrier for reducing noise pollution's ability to penetrate into near shore ecosystems. And this, protects species listening spaces. Now remember, that's the distance at which they can perceive a signal associated with communication. And so this would be great if this is true. Unfortunately, if this is the case, it means that as kelp forests decline, something that is happening globally, their ability to attenuate or block noise pollution declines as well. And so this service that we think is very valuable may be declining. And so 
we can't just leave this as a theory though. And so if you're really keen to see data added to this concept, then you're gonna to have to follow us as we head to Bamfield. So this is Isabel Cote, M Lim, and Claire Atridge and I. Um, and we're going to head into the water and we're going to investigate this concept in more detail, thinking specifically about the role of kelp forests in mitigating species exposure to noise pollution. And so with that, I'd like to once again thank all of those who make the work that I do possible. And also, they make it a lot of fun, which is really the reason I'm still in the field. And our generous funders for supporting the work that we do and really research in Canada and globally, and those who steward the lands that I call home. And I'll take any questions. What's an RCA? Uh, sorry, an RCA is a rock fish conservation area. And if there's no the questions there, thank you so much, Karen, for that. There was a lot of information in there. And I'm sure we're going to be getting uh, a few more questions coming in here on the chat. I see you're monitoring them. So mm -hmm. that's excellent. Yeah, that was admittedly quite a bit of information. So if there's any clarification needed, follow-ups? Um, oh, sorry. So yeah, Joanne, sorry, the people in Zoom can't hear you very well. Um, Joanne just said that, you know, questions will come in via the chat or the room um, and I can moderate them uh, accordingly. So if you want anything clarified, just shout it out or put it in the chat. And I hope you enjoy the talk. You can't what? People have trouble hearing you. Oh, okay. Let's try to do the unmask. Is that better? You, you really need to be closer to the camera. Say something now. Okay, how's that? No, that's so nice. Just to stop. Um, I, 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 okay, so everybody, I apologize for the difficulty with the sound, and uh, we haven't quite figured out how to do that. Uh, Karen, if you can uh, do the questions from there, because uh, certainly my sound's not picking up something. Yeah, you know what we can do um, is I can hear you, Joan. So if you can hear me, if anybody asks a question around you, just say it and I'll repeat it before I answer it so no one's lost in the dialogue. Um, and then anyone on Zoom, I can hear so we can do that. This is our lives in the modern world. It's all part of the process but hats off to you for running a hybrid um they're becoming unfortunately rare and people are you know forced to go back into situations they maybe don't want to be in just yet and so i think the, the hybrid is commendable but tough oh, thanks for that uh, vote of confidence there you go Lewis. Yes. Yes. Talk for us. Um, to go about team has also done a talk for us on things in the shipment. And at the beginning of the year, we had a talk on odor uh, by um, Mika Kundazi from Music. So I just feel like your talk is just really fitting into all those things that we talked about previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. So for those of you on Zoom, um, uh, we're just highlighting the different people that I've overlapped with. Um, so that would be Micah, who knows more about Odalis than I would say any person under 50 on the coast. Um, Seagal, Margo, um, many good people that I've interacted with over the years and through the Wanas lab specifically. Um, there's a great question in the, in the chat, which is, did COVID make a difference to anthropogenic sounds that you could measure? And the question, and the answer is absolutely. So this was really interesting on many levels. Um, so we'll go very broadly. Uh, 
COVID shut down anthropogenic noise in the ocean in a big way. It was called the anthropause. Um, and there was still some shipping going on and there was many ships that stayed out there, but it was a big decline. And this was measured um, by a couple of research groups. So Carlos de Torte from Saudi Arabia led some efforts in this. Amanda Bates, who's now at UVic, uh, did some great work on this. And then Francis Juanes and collaborators from New Zealand did work on this as well. And some of the things that they found were really staggering. And so this was that species listening space that I talked about. You were finding changes, you know, by like 80 and 90% to that. So all of a sudden species can hear. And the stories you heard about species moving back into areas, specifically cetaceans, um, a lot of those weren't anecdotal by the time COVID was over. That was the case. So the decline in noise pollution changed the extent to which species move through systems. So yeah, certainly COVID gave us a great look at what can happen when you reduce some of these. And that scaled a lot by country, right? In many ways, it was the most expensive global underwater noise experiment that's ever happened. Um, and so, you know, that allowed us to say, okay, New Zealand was, my sister lives there, um, was incredibly regulated. And so, uh, Canada, maybe less so than New Zealand and this kind of scaling. So yeah, certainly had an impact on the noise pollution levels. As a sound person, why do hybrid meetings have poor in person? As, okay, I've got a question in the chat about, um, why is sound so poor? So really, um, the the sound problems with some of these meetings when you're trying to run hybrids uh, let, 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 let me interrupt uh, i i can explain about the uh, the sound problem uh, it's a speaker it's connection issue, right i'm sorry it's a speaker connection issue and a microphone your speaker would it connect right um the, uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm listening to myself here i, I i'm not sure this is the first time we tried this uh, um, Logitech camera speaker that uh, USB connected, and uh, it doesn't seem to pick up the sound very well, and I don't know why. We'll have to experiment. Uh, I apologize, but uh, it, it's not something obvious. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly it is going to be a challenging thing to figure out, but you know, it's growing pains like anything we've dealt with in the last couple of years. Um, you know, I don't think many of us had heard of Zoom you know, three years ago. Um, and now we're all fairly good at it. Um, a great question about the uh, LNG traffic and the central coast. And really I would extend this up to the North coast as well. Um, there are certainly concerns. And so World Wildlife Fund Canada has been um, very vocal in this space. And um, Hussein is one of the, he's a marine scientist with them, is one of the conservation mentors on my fellowship. And so, yeah, certainly they're very worried. Um, and really this is because the North and Central Coast are gonna open up in a big way in terms of shipping if these resource projects go ahead. And in many ways, some of the cetaceans in those systems are not currently subjected to the same amount of stressors. And so this will increase the noise pollution in these systems. Um, that's an important part of that conversation. We've put in some proposals to try to map noise pollution on the coast with this in mind. And yeah, that is that is certainly a, that's I would say in many ways that's one of the major talking points halting some of those projects from going on. And I mean, just to extend that further, that's also being led by many of the Central Coast nations. I'm thinking specifically about Sakira, um, which is a collaboration across several nations, and their concerns with noise pollution, among other things, including spills. Oh. You want to ask? So um, I have a question about the the midshipmen because the the noise that they make is so loud and audible even through the air from people quite far away. Are the female fishes in the kind of deep water hearing this sound and then swimming up to where? they're hearing the sound or are they kind of only, are they coming into the, the shallow water on the high tide? And if so, why, why make such a loud sound? Like, is it 
because they, it needs to travel a long distance to um, to reach the females? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think both of those things are true. Um, and so the females are coming up from depth and as they come up into an area, you know, many of the beaches on our coast are going to have, you know, we have phenomenal beaches here for midshipmen in many locations. And so where specifically they're going to end up is mediated by sound. And so that would be the advantage of calling very loud and for long periods of time. Um, so that we would call like a micro macro habitat adjustment for sound. So as you're coming into an area, you're, you're walking the street. I like to actually think a lot of these in terms of like social events that I would go to. If you're walking on a street and you're trying to figure out which bar you're going to go to, which one sounds fun, right? Which one sounds bumping and there's people there. That's something we cue to, right? And so I think in many ways it would be the same um, as they're coming up, where are they going to go? And then, but when you get down to that, you know, real micro habitat, you have small area in front of you. Now the males are competing right? And that's real competition. You've ended up on a beach, you're a female, you have to be very, very careful with your eggs. Survivorship late rates are very low of these eggs. And so you have to allocate them to the right male. And so that competition in many ways has created that noise because if, you know, the male next to me starts singing louder, I'm going to sing louder. And through time and iteration and generations and evolution, it's created a fish that has really, really impressive sonic muscles. So I think both of what your points are true. Um, and you know, it, beyond that, I think the, the research on what happens when they leave and midshipmen at depth is really an unknown scenario. And so I, I always get really excited when I talk to Seagal because she's thinking about a lot of these questions. And so we're still on picking apart some of that. Are they coming back to the same beaches every year, much like salmon and many other species that make migration do? Is there a little bit more mixing? Um, of the population. And so, yeah, but I think sounds playing a very large role in both of those scenarios you described. Um, there's a question on does aquatic noise affect land animals like wolves who feed on the coast? Hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think it depends on the kind of noise you're talking about. Um, noise pollution maybe less so, um, you know, because so sound has trouble transitioning from water to air. Um, and that's because of the density differences. Sound actually is relatively, uh, has a relatively easy time transitioning from air to water. So like a highway next to a beach, you can really hear that in the water. Um, but wolves using sound, I would say, maybe less so in terms of the kind of uh, sounds I've been describing tonight, but certainly wolves would use, just like I would use if I was walking on a beach, the sounds of you know clams uh, shooting out water as the tide goes down. They do certain sound indicators for quality habitat where they should be foraging if they heard any sort of interaction. So a stranded seal, a seal pup would be a good example of that they're going to queue to that beach. So certainly wolves foraging in coastal areas um, would involve sound. Um, and this would be true of, you know, wolves and salmon runs and these kind of things, you know, bears, a lot of that is done at night, the vast majority. Um, you know, Tom Rankin on the coast mapped that out over many years. And a lot of foraging happens at night when we lose vision. And in that case, bears are very olfactory as well, but sound does play a role. 